Okay, good morning everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Please let me thank you the organizers for inviting me to come here and spend this, uh, uh, unfortunately, only a couple of days. It has been a very interesting meeting, so let's get starting. I've changed my title uh, to Beyond the Power Spectrum of the Density Field because uh, at the moment of the presentation of the aspirat, I didn't know if this work was going to be ready. It's about recent data and it has been recently announced, so I thought you would be interested to know about this. So why this title? It's because with very few notable exceptions, most of the information we have about cosmology come basically from the power spectrum of the density field. And the only exception I can think about is standard candles. Everything else basically comes from the power spectrum. And there is a massive amount of information that we are neglecting by only looking at the power spectrum of the density field. The issue is, is this information actually accessible and at what price? For those of you who don't know what the power spectrum is, it's the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function. And for those of you who cannot do Fourier transform in their heads, let's just think of it as a graphic equalizer. You can have two completely different pieces of music that sounds completely different, and they, yet they look the same in a graphic equalizer. So there's much more information out there than what there is in a power spectrum. And also, uh, what I will concentrate on after having seen the spectacular results from the Planck uh, collaboration, is in exploring the lower Redshift universe, as also the exploration of a large survey of galaxies underwent an exponential expansion in the past few years and will be driving cosmology until the next generation of CMB experiment. And in particular, I will talk about uh, the uh, survey from the Sloan Digital Sky Telescope, 2.5 meter at the Apache Point in New Mexico. There have been already talks at this conference about uh, Sloan and in particular about BOSS, so I would not say a lot about it. Just say that the, bar the baryon uh, oscillation spectroscopic survey is made thinking of baryon acoustic oscillation. And therefore, it selects, uh, it's, uh, uh, this is the uh, galaxy ratio distribution. It uh, targets luminous red galaxies to cover very large volume with uh, a lot signal to noise and beat down shot noise. This is the sky coverage. And if you want to look at the numbers, they are here. I will concentrate it on the what's called the C mass sample, which effective redshift is 0.57. And in particular, we are interested in something that is called the bias spectrum. Uh, the bias spectrum is the Fourier correspondence of the three-point correlation function. So you move on from a two-point correlation function or graphic equalizer of power spectrum to the next level of correlation. And there are many challenges of opportunity offered by going this way. So if the initial the fluctuation field was Gaussian, as seen in the cosmic microwave background. Then gravity makes the distribution of the dark matter non-Gaussian just because of nonlinear gravitational evolution. Then there are uh, biases because we see galaxies, and except for weak gravitational lensing, we don't see directly the dark matter, which also introduces some deviation from Gaussianity and observational issues. So if you had a fully gas, a perfect Gaussian field, the power spectrum would tell you everything about your field. But the moment where the field becomes non-Gaussian, you need something else. And actually, the bias spectrum is the first higher order correlation that starts growing due to gravity. So that's why we want to look at that. And it's a blast from the past since I'm going back to what has been the theme of my PhD. So, this is, again, a simulation of uh, what the dark matter, this evolved dark matter distribution is. When you only look at the linear regime in order to get rid of complicated nonlinearity, you are doing this operation. So you are losing a lot of information. And a lot of the cosmological information we have from surveys is studying basically this regime. So you imagine how much information you are losing. So the bias spectrum is one of the way to try to push and gather the information that is there. So here is the quantity, it's a three-point function, so it depends on three k vectors, which needs to close to form a closed triangle, and so this is your B by spectrum. In second-order three-level perturbation theory for dark matter and for Gaussian initial condition, 
that's a very simple assumption. For local quadratic bias, you can write it down. This depends on the power spectrum. This is a, some, a function that is called kernel, which depends on the shape of the triangle you pick up. And it's a powerful test of gravitational instability. That is, do we really understand that gravity behaves like Einstein gravity, even at cosmological scales? We are talking about many orders of magnitude extrapolation. We tested gravity with precision test only on solar system scales, and also on bias. However, this is talking about spherical chaos, because the real world is much more complicated than that. So, I've, I've done this before, or more than a decade ago, and the spirit of the approach back then was simpler because the statistical error bars were larger. So to be realistic, to go beyond spherical cows, the three-level perturbation theory is limited. You need to work on very large scale and you still lose a lot of information. The bias, that is the relation between dark matter and galaxy, is likely to be non-local, non-linear and messy. Uh, there are redshift space distortions. We don't get to observe distances of objects. We observe redshift, and this redshift is not our perfect distance indicator because the university is clumpy, and so there are deviations from a uniformable low. There's obviously a lot of interesting cosmological information there if you can disentangle it, and these are also nonlinear. Um, a real survey has a mask and a selection function, and the bias spectrum from different tri triplets are highly correlated. And if you want to extract cos cos some cos cosmological parameter from a statistical quantity, you need to know the probability distribution function. And what's the probability distribution function of B anyway? Nobody knows. So before I go on, acknowledgement and references. This is a work that has been going on for more than three years. It's the bulk of the work of a thesis and a first postdoc of Hector, Hector Kilmarin. And he has been, obviously, the common denominator among all these papers, and I'm going to try to give you, give you a flavor of that. Uh, so first, zero order challenge. Go on and compute a bias spectrum. All right? In a modest box of 512 cube, still spherical cows here, there are 10 to the 16 triangles. So this gives you an idea of the dilution of the information from going from the power spectrum to the higher order correlation. There are only less than a million power spectra, independent power spectra mode in there. So look at the dilution of information. OK, they are highly correlated, but still it's a challenge. And so the only approach that has been tried successfully so far is to do a random sum sample for each shape and size. And for a suitably large sample, you do not lose a lot of signal to noise by gaining speed. But this is a poor man, poor data compression, and I'm sure in principle one could do better. I just haven't come up with anything like that. And note that this works well as long as Rashi space distortion are, you can, do, no, uh, you, you neglect Rashi space distortion, so you only care about the monopole if Rashi space distortion are present, because by doing this random sample in Fourier space, you do an angle average. So let's see number one, number three, and number four. The way to get around this is basically to calibrate that on straight and body simulation and find a fitting formula. Forget about perturbation theory. Any expansion of the perturbation theory breaks down really quickly. What you end up fitting is not the bias spectrum itself, but it's divided by this power spectra, just to get rid of the cosmology dependence. Now, triangles come in all shape and sizes. So in a grid, they will look like this. You better imagine it this way. And so you end up having all these plots of bias spectrum as a function of the ratio between two triangle and the angle between them. And so this has been done both in real and Rashi space in these two papers, and you can reach a 5% accuracy as long as you deal with dark matter. Uh, I'm pleased to report that many of the simulation were actually run in the local cluster Hypatia. This is Hypatia, it looks like a fridge. And uh, uh, I'm pleased to report that the, 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 the size and the number of simulation is huge. It's cover a big volume in order to reduce the statistical error on this part of the modeling. So let's keep going on. Bias is likely to be non-local and non-linear and messy. A real survey has max selection function. The, your estimators are correlated and we don't know their PDF. So the way to approach this is basically 
to use mocks of your survey. And it's a fundamental role that mocks of survey play, both for testing the pipeline and for estimating the error distribution. I repeat it here again, it's crucial to have a very large sample of mock of your survey that include all the real world effect that your survey have, and many of them if you have to study your error distribution. And so in the Zulian collaboration, the whole suite of mock was done by Mark Manera and collaborators. Okay, so the name of the game is to use a model of the nonlinear power spectrum monopole in Rashi space, which can be modeled very well on my linear scale, but I spare you the details because the equation run over two pages, and it's something that it's not, I'm not going to focus here. And of the bispectrum monopole in Rashi space, again, I spare you the detail because the equation run over many pages and there's a lot of calibration for simulation. And then measure cosmological interesting quantities, which end up being two bias parameter. This F, which is the growth rate of perturbation, which is an important ingredient for testing gravity and it's very fashionable quantity to measure. The amplitude of the perturbation at the effective redshift, plus some other nuisance parameters that say, is the shot noise really Poisson or not? And uh, non modeling of nonlinear redshift space distortion would get marginalized over those are in uninteresting parameters. So let's look at the data. This is how the POK look. These are the two parts of the Sloan survey, the north bit and the south bit. And the analysis on the data has been presented in this paper. Um, and the line are the best fit model, which I'm gonna now explain how it was obtained. And this is how the bias spectrum looks like. Uh, so what we gather from here is that the model we have seems to be a reasonable fit to the data, and so gravitational instability paradigm plus a bias model that works on dark matter halos has calibrated on the mocks works extremely well. How do we deal, however, with this? Again, we have seven free parameters, only the first four are for interest in cosmology. What you do, since you have many mocks, you define your estimator, you do the same analysis on the mock as on the data, and then you shift the distribution of the mock to sit exactly on top to where the data lie, and those, and use those contours to estimate your error bar. It's sort of like doing a Fisher kind of estimate of your error. It's called a Monte Carlo estimate of your error, except that your Monte Carlo is a suit of mock surveys. Uh, okay, so these are the cosmological interesting quantity. Of course, you see there are big degeneracies. So this is telling you that really you don't measure uh, four quantity. You really measure only, uh, only three combinations of them. And these are the combination with the error bars. For reference, the Planck cosmology sits there, so no major tension here. Uh, there is no appreciable dependence on the assumed underlying linear power spectrum. Remember, you are sensitive on the shape, not on the amplitude. The amplitude is a parameter that you measure. We worry about the shape, not of the amplitude. Basically, what happened is that with, with Planck, the shape of the primordial power spectrum is known well enough in the range of k's that is relevant for this analysis. Remember, this is the linear power spectrum. And in this range of k's, apart from a running spectral index, anything else has altered the power spectrum on other scales, so that's fine. Okay, we also studied the dependence on the maximum k, that is how far into the nonlinear regime you can go. And we find no appreciable dependence. Uh, however, we start seeing some shape dependence, so we are conservative and say stop at a K max of 0.17 megaparsec over H, but if you want to be more aggressive, you can push a little bit beyond and shrink the error bar a little bit more. So what are the implications? Well, it turns out that both galaxies are highly biased. Their bias is not simple, linear, or local. This is obvious in insight, because if you do select highly biased object that sits in very rare location of the density field, it's easy to think that then their bias is going to be complicated, but, in, but it's a bit scary if you want to obtain information about the distribution of the dark matter from the distribution of light if this relation is complicated. Um, we find that uh, in our budget of the error bar, 
the system, systematic error bars start by incomparable with the statistical one. And these are systematics in the modeling, in the theoretical modeling. Even more effort, despite us working for three years, is needed to understand power spectrum and B spectrum of tracers in Rashi space. So from the extensive tests that we have done, halos in real space, fine. Dark matter in real space, fine. Dark matter in Rashi space, fine. The moment when you look at tracers in Rashi space, something breaks down. And we don't know what it is, and that's our systematic in the error budget. For this survey, the systematic are still below the statistical error, but increase the volume for this kind of tracers, it's not gonna gain, you're not gonna gain much because you're gonna, you have reached an error floor. But anyway, the, the GR by spectrum kernel works. So at the beginning, when we started in this journey, we thought that this would be a very strong test of GR, but then, uh, we explored, even with, with numerical simulation, some example of modifications of GR, like, for example, F of R model. And it turns out that F of R model don't actually modify too much the GR by spectrum kernel. But this is an issue that is still, that is still open. So it's, uh, it, it's an issue out there. How general is the GR by spectrum kernel also to models of modified gravity? And that the number we came up with is this the peculiar combination of the instantaneous growth rate and the amplitude of the perturbation are the effective redshift of the survey. And this is again reported there. So let me move on and interpret this and see what it means. Comparison with other measurements. So in the space of F sigma 8, this measurement is here. Remember, this is bispectrum monopole and, and power spectrum monopole. There are other measurements of a combination of this quantity that comes from the angular dependence with respect to the line of sight of the power spectrum or the correlation function that it's come purely from a Rashi space distortion. And this is the combination that is reported here. And this is the Planck constraints assuming a lambda CDM cosmology. These two measurements don't assume a lambda CDM cosmology. They don't even assume strictly GR, okay? So how good is it really? The ratio of, of the measured quantity to the quantity in the lambda CDM is constrained at the 10 to 15% level. This is some conservative error bar. This is some little bit less conservative error bar. So this is how good it is. You can still use it to do cosmology. So for example, since you have a constraint on the amplitude of the perturbation effectively, you can use the constraints uh, neutrinos properties, because neutrinos do affect the growth of perturbation. And so when you combine this measurement to the constraints coming from Planck, you can shrink the Planck constraints by a factor of, uh, uh, you know, 2 to 30 percent, depending on the neutrino model you use and how much CMB data you want to use, and this is reported here. Also, you can use it to constrain dark energy properties and curvatures. Usually you see this plot, an equation of state of dark energy, omega curvature, equation of state of dark energy, and, and, and it's time derivative and so on. Uh, when you combine with, uh, say, this is for a, a, a flat, especially flat model, this is a for a model where also the curvature is allowed to vary. The CMB would not constrain that. It will have a perfect degeneracies, but you can break the degeneracies, and it, you find the results that are completely consistent with, say, what you get at in BAO, but they come from completely different physics. You can move on and try testing GR. It's fashionable to parameterize this F like that, and then try to measure this gamma. The constraints of this gamma are reported here. This is not spectacular, but let's think about it. If you parameterize this f this way, this is telling you that if you go back in time where omega matter gets closer to unity, any kind of, of uh, modification of gravity will look, of this form will look like GR. And so the fact that the measurement is at redshift 0.57 means that you are not too sensitive to this kind of gamma. It depends what your model of modification of GR actually predicts for that. 
Uh, there are other models of modification of GR, for example, that come from coupling the dark matter to the dark energy, and the coupling constant is parameterized by this epsilon, and then you actually get some interesting constraint on this epsilon because this, sorry, in this, in the, this eta, because this eta is now a defective redshift of the survey, and the coupling between dark matter and dark energy, once you open that Pandora box, it doesn't necessarily need to be constant in redshift, and so this is what you will find that the constraints on the coupling constant at this redshift. So you can go on again and try to break this F sigma eight degeneracy by combining uh, the cons this constraint, which come only from the monopole with the quadrupole to monopole ratio. In principle, doing this operation is a mess because the two measurements are correlated, but again, with resort to the MOX, we do the same operation on the real data as on the MOX, and so you automatically estimate all the correlation and the full PDF from the distribution of the MOX. And so by doing that, we were able to break the degeneracy between F and sigma eight, and like this. Now, Error bars need to shrink by about a factor of two to three in order to constrain model deviation from GR that have been uh, proposed in the literature. But it's still a valuable option of actually trying to split these two because it's, it reminds you a little bit of, of the BAO. If when, you, when in the BAO you measure dV, which is the angle average one, you have a mix of information between dA and H of Z, and H of Z is the instantaneous expansion rate, and here we are talking about the instantaneous growth rate, and this is the integrated growth rate. Okay, so conclusion for this part, selecting highly biased object is good, only for BAO science. Bias and Rashi space distortion are complicated and there is an interplay between them and I'm not even sure we have that fully under control. Despite the effort, we are now limited by systematics in the modeling, but even though we were able to find the determination of both instantaneous growth rate and integrated growth rate at the effective redshift of the survey. So if I have another five minutes, uh, let me switch gear and talk about another a way of going beyond the power spectrum of the density perturbation. And I want to, this is a sale pitch, I want to say a few words about Core Plus, the Cosmic Origin Explorer. So if you, have, if you were this morning at the cosmology section, there was a very illustrative and detailed talk by Jose Alberto uh, Rubino, but uh, let me just give you the, the sale pitch here. So the Big key questions that this is going to go after is what is the physics behind inflation and did the inflation really occur? So uh, you want to think a little bit, there's a parallelism here because inflation is driven by a scalar field and you know, until 2012 we were invoking scalar field all over the place, both in cosmology and in physics, but none has ever, nobody has ever seen a scalar field. But then at CERN, the, the Higgs, has been seen, that's a scalar field, and that's a similar, a similar way of saying thing, except that you're using the Big Bang as the accelerator and you want to see the effect of the scalar field in this accelerated expansion of the, of the universe right after the Big Bang. Now, the way to, to do that, to go beyond what we have already learned from the temperature, of the cosmic Mercury background and the E-mode polarization of the cosmic Mercury background is to go with what is called the B-mode polarization of the cosmic Mercury background. And we had a taste of this earlier uh, this year. Um, primordial gravitational wave discovery had a whole new era of physics. Gravitational waves could help unite general relativity and quantum mechanics to reveal a theory of everything, the Guardian. Cosmic inflation, spectacular discovery, hail, BBC News, the data de las ondas del primer instante del universo, el país, and this is the famous interview to mm -hmm. Andy Linda. Okay, that's the result of bicep two. This is, I like to think of this as, you know, this is the, 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 the last scattering surface. When you look at light and electromagnetic radiation, you cannot go earlier than the last scattering surface. However, Gravity waves and neutrinos are insensitive to that, 
And so this gives you a window in all this early epoch of the universe, where the physics we believe were very simple, except here that we don't really know what happened, but it cannot be directly observed. And again, since you are going very back in time uh, at the inflation epoch, it may try to give you a hint of what is a new completion of the theory of gravity, for example, if you can learn something about that. So it's extremely interesting and important, of course, but with her, we learned the hard way, it is not easy. Big Bang finding challenge, nature. Big Bang theory possibly foiled by dust. Big Bang discovery comes under fire. Rumors ripple about flows in the discovery of gravitational wave in the Big Bang aftermath by National Geographic. I don't even have to go to scientific papers to actually know about that. Uh, we live in a galaxy. The galaxies emit at the same frequency. You are trying to look for these uh, uh, gravitational waves. The galaxy doesn't know about E modes and B modes and doesn't know about handness of primordial perturbation. The galaxy just emits. And you have to subtract that. Bicep 2 experiment Big Bang controversy highlights challenges for modern science. So let's learn this from the Washington Post and let's see how we can go beyond that. Well, the solution is, well, bring out the big guns. Uh, again, see the talks by Jose Alberto this morning. And so these are the big guns. Go and cover many frequency bands. The CMB is very nearly a black body spectrum, probably with small deviation that can be used to learn again about fundamental physics, but it behaves completely different in frequency than galaxy. And so that's the key to disentangle astrophysics from you know, the physics of scalar fields. So there is an European proposal, that's what core plus is, going for an M4 call. Uh, these are the country officially involved as of this morning. And if you are interested to learn more or want to be involved in the working group, uh, the contact for Spain are Enrique Martínez González, José Alberto Rubino Martín, and me. To give you a taste of what this can do is if these are the constraints of Planck on parameters of uh, the parameters that can be related to the shape and amplitude of this inflaton potential, that is the shape and amplitude of this uh, scalar primordial scalar field, this is what can be achieved around some fiducial model with this mission compared to only the upper limit that we know so far. And these are some inflationary models that have appeared in the literature. So for those of you who are interested in very big and fundamental questions, there is a tight relation between a measurable quantity that is related to the amplitude of these uh, polarization B modes to how much this field has moved during inflation. And there is a, an important threshold there, whether the field has moved more or less than the Planck mass, because different kinds of physics will drive it. So different kind of interpretation of what is an UV completion of gravity you would have, whether the field has moved more or less than a Planck mass. And so this kind of experiment has a sensitivity that can allow you to answer this question, as it moves more or less than a Planck mass. As well as a lot of other science, I invite you to go and visit uh, the webpage with the corresponding uh, white papers, but just to give you a flavor Let's just think of the neutrino sectors. So we know that at the minimum mass given by neutrino oscillation, neutrinos uh, cover uh, uh, amount for 0.5% of the content of the universe. And so you will be able to measure the properties of this 0.5% of the composition of the universe at this level. So meaning that we are talking precision cosmology because it's measuring at many sigma the mass of a 0.5% comp component of the universe. So I just leave you with this uh, flavor. 
of the possibility. Of course, there is a lot of science, for example, that can be done about galactic magnetic field just because one man trash is another man treasure. What you need to subtract to get to the primordial signal is something that has got its own value to learn about astrophysical processes closer to us than the Big Bang. And so let me finish with one slide of advertising. If you find that this Lambda CDM model with uh, a cosmological constant, a scalar field in inflation, dark energy and dark matter, it's a little bit too baroque, uh, we are gonna meet uh, in a cold and dark place. After all, most of the universe is dark. Uh, this January, and of course, you are welcome to come and participate. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Litia. We have time for a few questions. Sí. You can shout. No, they won't. Thank you, Gonzalo. So it is just that Alberto said that this uh, Core Plus mission is a, a second version of a large mission program. So I would like to know, you know, which features you lose for going into a smaller budget. Because, you know, I don't like this idea about always cheaper, faster, better astronomy. Sometimes you need money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a key piece of science that uh, must be dropped to go in uh, cheaper, which is studying the intrinsic spectral distortions uh, of the CMB light. Uh, so, so far, we all assume that the cosmic microwave is a black body and assume it's a black body and just work with it. But in reality, the, 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 the nature of the fact that there are perturbations in the early universe create on small scales some distortions. And it, there's a whole kind of new physics in there. It's like opening a new window, which will uh, allow you to measure basically the same cosmological parameter that you will measure with the temperature. But since you rely on a completely different physics, it will nicely tie in and, and give you some confidence that the underlying framework you are using actually works. I mean, we are, we are making we are making crucial assumption when we interpret this, the, the CMB light and say, you know, omega matter is this. Uh, that needs to be dropped. More questions? Yes, Eduardo. Uh, <clears throat> besides the the bias due to traces. Uh, at which extent uh, would the um, uh, stellar feedback affect uh, some of these kind of uh, studies? Okay, uh, ec extremely hot and interesting subject. Also because the kind of feedback uh, you mentioned uh, changes the shape even of the, of the dark matter uh, power spectrum at uh, relatively large scales. We're talking K of, of one. Uh, here we are completely ignoring this also because we don't push to such small scales according to the latest models for this uh, uh, effect you are mentioning. The effect you are mentioning is, however, crucial for weak gravitational lensing. So the moment where we want to analyze the power spectrum of weak gravitational lensing even without going to the higher order correlation, that is a fundamental limiting factor. And it's still an open issue how to deal with it. The safest issue is stop at larger scales, but of course you're throwing away a lot of information. And it's very hotly debated right now. I don't have a solution. But which are the smallest scales that you can trace with this? So it, it depends a little bit on the tracers you're using. At very small scales, you have two effects. 
the shot noise starts dominating and at that point you cannot extract signal anymore mm -hmm. and your description of nonlinear evolution starts breaking down. Yeah. And so right now, uh, we, with, uh, with the description we have, a disaffective redshift in real space and for dark matter, we could push to k of 0.3, 0.4. Mm -hmm. When a moment redshift space come in and bias come in, you have to stop earlier. Yeah. Uh, but people that do weak lensing, they do push to much, much higher k's, also because by being projected, a mode in the sky correspond to different scales, different physical scales. Yeah. Here we can do a cleaner separation of mildly nonlinear to highly nonlinear scales. Okay, we thanks again, Alicia Verde. <laughs> and